Coming up on Plane Crazy Down Under. We catch up with Marjorie Pagani from Angel Flight for an update on the organisation's vital work and how you can get involved. As a minimum standard, we need 400 hours total time in a GA aircraft and we need 250 in command. And we present part one of our series speaking to one of Australia's true aviation pioneers, Steve Paget. There were 10 people in that course, and all of them, of course, were very studious kids with a lot of ability. But of all the 10, I was the only one three years later that actually stayed in aviation. So with Steve back in the studio after a little medical adventure, it's time to get plain crazy. Well, hi everyone and welcome back to the show. This is, of course, the show where we love to talk aviation right here in Australia and around this part of the world. Well, let's see, sliced, diced, cracked open, re-plumbed, put back together. Look, it's me, Grant McHeron, Steve Vischer, I'm back. I know, right? This is amazing. Uh, last episode, you were in hospital. Yes, I was and... Uh, well, it's, it's it's been quite a uh, quite an experience, and I um, we won't talk about it too much here. But yes, I did unfortunately suffer a, a bit of a heart attack, and um, yes, and it's been a bit of a journey to get back from that. And I've written extensively about it, and uh, I think I've talked about it on other shows a lot. So we can probably no need to rehash it here. But I do want to say at the outset that um, the support that I've got from the audience of this show and from uh, guests and, and and listeners, all sorts of people, people from the podcast world has just been amazing and really uh, I just want to give a, a heartfelt thanks to everyone who supported me right through this process. Uh, as we record this now, it's uh, it's been about three months since that happened and I'm doing fine. Um, a lot of exercise, a bit of weight loss um, and, uh, you know, lots of recovery and, and just doing what the doctors tell me and, um, you know, I'm working back to uh, full health and uh, I'm going to get there. It's, uh, it's, it's been a real journey. And, um, you know, actually, Grant, there's been some, uh, some positive things out of this too. So, uh, and again, I've written about all of that. You can check out my blog if you like. It's at proceedaspect.com.au. And uh, I've, 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 I've tried to just sort of lay it all out there for what this experience has been like uh, and what that means for the future. So obviously from an aviation standpoint, my uh, big challenge here is going to be getting fit enough to uh, get past our good friends at AvMed. See, I call them good friends now, Grant, because I need them. <laughs> but uh, but that's something that, uh, you know, I'll be tackling in 2024. Right now, the uh, the focus is getting my ONSA medical back, which is the railway equivalent of a CASA medical. ONSA, of course, being the Office of the National Rail Safety Regulator, which is basically the, uh, the organisation that uh, oversees uh, all of that sort of stuff in the rail industry here in Australia. So uh, we're working towards that. It's all looking pretty good. So uh, with all of that said, uh, once again, there's been so many people. Mick from the Frankston Line Grant, what a funny guy he is. <laughs> but he wasn't the only one. There's been there's been so many and uh, particularly uh, I'd like to single out uh, just Owen's up. He's been massively supportive. You know, you think back, Grant, and we actually interviewed uh, Owen right back at the start of this new series in, uh, where he was talking about something that actually turns out that uh, was quite a similar situation. And I remember thinking at the time, could I ever be resilient enough to get through something like that? God forbid if it ever happened to me. And little did I know something dun, dun, dun. <laughs> sort of kind of similar did happen to me only a few months later. But uh, Owen has been, uh, you know, we, we talk quite a lot and he's been a, a huge supporter and a great help. So I really do appreciate that. But like I say, having a support network around you if something like this does happen to you is is the most important thing. And, uh, you know, the aviation community. We've been doing this a long time, Grant, and sometimes I wonder whether, you know, we've, we've touched people's lives or whatever, Or, but, uh, you know, people have been there and, and really yeah. supported me. So I, I'm really appreciate I really appreciate it. Yeah, mate, it has been great to uh, see all the support you've been getting and you've been telling me about the emails. And, yeah, thanks, Mick. I can always count on Mick from the – formerly from the Frankston line. Formerly from the Frankston line, yeah. yeah. You Love should get guy. back here, Mick. You wouldn't even recognise that track now with all the work they've done to it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? He, he should come back and give it a run. Yes. But, uh, mate, I do have to say two things that occurred with this. One, before you went for the op and you were in there after the attack and Kit and I went to visit you in the hospital and Kathy rocks up and we all agreed it was a hell of a way to get the four of us to actually catch up in the same space-time <laughs> coordinates. We've been <laughs> trying to get together for ages to catch up the four of us and – yeah, it took you having a heart attack to make it happen. I mean, a bit extreme there, mate, right from the, uh, you know, hot black desiato school of tax avoidance, mate. Yes, that's exactly right. Nothing like being dead for tax purposes, but uh, I don't know, just looking at my tax bill lately, I don't know. I don't think it worked, Grant. I don't think it worked. 
Yeah, no, it's just it's right up there with my cunning plan for world domination through lotto win. But, you know, something that I'd love to do if I ever do win the lotto and get to get my fixed wing and get a really nice aircraft and all that kind of stuff is is to give back and to help out. Mm-hmm. And to help those in need, especially people out in rural areas. Yeah, it's it's a great thing to do. And uh, I think if we were ever in that fortunate position, or who, who knows, Grant, perhaps we'll become zillionaires out of podcasting in about 500 years from now. But, uh, you know, when we do eventually get that aircraft with the <laughs> nice big plane crazy logo on it, it would be lovely to uh, actually, um, you know, volunteer our skills and our aircraft for a great organisation like Angel Flight. And uh, we've caught up with Angel Flight before uh, in previous uh, iterations of the show, but uh, we thought, Grant, it was high time that we caught up with Marjorie Pagani, the Chief Executive Officer of Angel Flight, just to see where things are going. And, uh, you know, she's been waiting very patiently on the line now while I've rambled on about myself. (laughs) So with that in mind, Marjorie, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Steve, and I'm really pleased uh, to be on the show. Well, it's great to talk to you again after so many years. Uh, I normally bump into you with the Yacht Air Show here and there and we have a chat, but, uh, yeah, it's been a few years, so we thought we might catch up and have a bit of a chat about Angel Flight and uh, how it's all been going. Sure, and and a lot's been happening, so it's really a good time to do a catch-up, Steve. Fantastic. So, Marjorie, for our uh, our listeners who, God forbid, may not know enough about Angel Flight, and there are some out there and we want to help spread the word, can you give us a really quick overview of Angel Flight, its uh, history and so on, and, and how it operates here in Australia? Yeah, sure. Look, we, uh, we're a national charity and we've been uh, running since 2003. And we kicked off in uh, the old air ambulance hangar in Sydney Airport uh, in 2003 with about 80 pilots and no passengers. And the object being, of course, was to get pilots involved with their own aircraft free of charge to bring people in from the bush. And that is rural, remote, regional, where they couldn't get into the cities for their major medical treatments, non-emergency, uh, unless they were driving, and usually uh, five, ten in Western Australia, sometimes fourteen hours each way. So the object was to try to bridge the gap between the the services and the benefits for health that city people get, and the great divide uh, between the cities and the bush. We've been doing that now, as I said, since 2003. Uh, We've done uh, just on 60,000 flights uh, at this stage at no cost to anybody and, of course, and no cost to government thus far. And uh, we also have uh, drivers on the ground, about 4,500 of them, Earth Angels, rightly called, (laughs) <laughs> and they pick you up from your uh, airport, destination airport, and take you to your hospital and uh, take you to your treatment, your accommodation, whatever you want. When you're finished, they'll bring you back and your private dedicated aircraft will be there waiting. So it's not a taxi service where we'll pick up all the way along the way. It's your flight for your needs and it will also uh, be a, a, an aircraft designed for you. Do, you. do you need to have steps, not walk up a wing? Do you need a big wheelchair in the back? And so on. We look off after all those logistics and the patient just turns up, jumps on board, does the flight to the city, does the drive, and we reverse it whenever the patient is ready we're ready to take them on. So you're doing like, it's got to be multiple flights per day based on those numbers. Yeah, look, we, we generally will do around 20 flights in a day. Uh, it was a bit slower at the start, of course. We were winding up and getting more pilots, but now we've got 3,500 pilots with their own aircraft. Uh, not everybody is on board at the same time, of course. People do have other lives. <laughs> Uh, but there's always a backup and we can always get somebody to do the job. And if necessary, if there's, uh, for example, severe weather, we have pretty strict rules about weather, uh, which are above what's required by CASA. We look at welfare and comfort. We fly in the daytime because that's more comfortable for people in a light aircraft. We don't fly in heavy turbulence and so on. So in those cases, if we can't change the appointment and if there is an RPT service available, then we might put uh, put them on a Rex or a Qantas 
out west if that's possible. Uh, but generally speaking, the uh, medical profession work really well with us and we might even say, look, can we delay this till the afternoon? The weather's abating down in that area. And we look at the weather carefully. We look at it every day, every flight to make sure we can give the passenger the most comfortable flight possible. Marjorie, I'd like to come back to the uh, pilot side of things in a minute, but uh, just thinking about everything you've just told us there, that's obviously a, a big logistical exercise and obviously a very expensive exercise. So can you tell us a bit about how Angel Flight is funded? Yes. Well, look, we we don't have uh, – we, we operate with myself and uh, five staff right across the nation, all out of a little Brisbane office. So we're pretty lean. Uh, our expenses are – most of our expenses – are for pilot fuel reimbursement. We also reimburse the drivers for their tolls in the bigger cities. We don't have any government funding, but on our new, what I call our parallel runway, we are now asking for government funding for that. But at the moment, uh, for all the passengers that need the medical treatment, uh, we spend nothing on marketing or advertising. And people help us, communities, Lions, CWA, Rotary, Probus and town councils put on events and functions for us so we don't have to spend any money doing that. And that's what keeps us going. It's a great, uh, really a great community organisation, really an Australia-wide community organisation when you look at it that way. That's right. We we go, there's nowhere we can't go. We don't have the restrictions of, of uh, other organisations and, um, of course, we're the only national organisation to do this, but uh, it's a matter of uh, the pilot assessing the field or the station airstrip, wherever, and saying, is this safe? Is this an approved place to land? And we go. We so far go to 360 ports across Australia, uh, but there's nowhere we won't go or can't go. Now, uh, you mentioned just before parallel runway. Is that where you're flying interns, locums and so on around the country? That's correct. We started this off a few years back where uh, we work with uh, a mob called Oka Medical Group and they were having trouble getting doctors in and out of remote areas. A good example is cholera and uh, At one stage last year it was flooded for three months. So there's no RPT in there and the roads were blocked. You couldn't get in and out. So, yeah, no medical help out there, nurse, allied help, doctors, nothing for three months. We learned about this and started talking to them and now we take their doctors out. We take allied health, we take nurses in every state and we've also got a pilot program running where we take medical professional students to the bush for placement. Now, for example, the nurses and allied health aren't funded for that and it can be a very long way, sometimes in South Australia, three days of driving. And the result is they don't really want to go. I can't imagine but why. Since, <laughs> no, I can't imagine either. <laughs> but since we've been, we fly them in and out, uh, for example, to Streaky Bay uh, from Adelaide, uh, six at a time, and they do their placements. When they're finished, we bring them back. And what we've found, the feedback is they're coming back and saying, what a great little town. I'd have never have gone there, but now I have, I love it, and I'd be happy to practice there. So we're having a real impact on showing the students what it can be like, how positive it can be to live in a small rural or remote town. Uh, and also, look, right across we're taking doctors up to Darwin. Uh, we're, we're also helping people with compassionate flights. So, for example, if you get hurt in an accident, one of the uh, air ambulance services out in the west will pick you up and bring you to a hospital. And that's that's their job, their air ambulance. We're not. But the people have to get home. So we get calls from the social workers in all the major hospitals to say, look, we're discharging Mr Smith today and he's got to get back to Burke and he had an accident and he's got no wallet and phone and we're discharging him in two hours. So we jump into action and we'll sometimes accommodate them overnight and then get them an aircraft in the morning or if we can, we'll take them straight home. So we take hundreds and hundreds of these emergency uh, patients back out when they are no longer 
an emergency. We just get them home. Uh, we also take people home to the communities. We took an old chap recently from Sydney to Kununurra. He wanted to die at home. Terminal patient, didn't want to die in a Sydney hospital. So we jump in and we take them home. So really, I know it sounds a bit uh, trite, but our, our motto is help where help is needed. And if you need help, all you need to do is ask. And if we can help with an aircraft, we will. We're not Centrelink. We don't want to see your bank account. We just want to know from your health professional, do you need our help? And that's enough. Now, Marjorie, you mentioned that uh, you're looking to government to assist with funding for uh, various and sundry projects uh, to do with the organisation. Certainly, um, I would have thought that any cost-benefit analysis uh, the government takes a look at would have to come out favourably for you. That's right, because it's very hard to quantify these benefits. Certainly, we can say, look, this is the cost. Uh, This is a cost per mile and this is the time saving, which in the case of the doctors is, is huge and the health staff. But the benefit to the community, you can't measure that. They can get into hospital. They can get home. They don't have to take all their kids with them. They can have a babysitter for the day. They don't have to have someone come in to their farm or hobby farm to look after all their animals because they're going to be away for a week driving. They're going to be away for a day and it makes a huge difference. I've, I've had a young lady, lovely, lovely young cancer patient, mum of two out in Dubbo, who really says, look, you saved my life, not so much physically but mentally. I couldn't have kept doing what I was doing organising the kids and getting babysitters and driving for two days. And that's the benefit which it's really hard to see. And if you haven't lived in the bush and tried to have access to general regular medical service, it's really hard to understand. And, look, there are other things which more sensitive things. We work with Heart Kids Australia. We have a partnership with them. And as you know, Heart Kids are sick kids. And they do have, sadly, a high death rate. I went to a meeting where I discovered from the mums and dads that the only way to get their kids home when they passed away was freight, airline freight or refrigerated food trucks. And I was horrified. And even though I'd been involved with Angel Flight for 20 years, it, it hadn't occurred to me. And now we have a team of pilots who are happy, we have ambulance uh, volunteers, people at hospitals who help to prepare the little ones and they're all prepared. We put them in the seats. We call their, they're they're our passengers. We call it Team Billy or Team Mary. We take them home. As far as the last one we took, Yam Island, on the top of the Torres Islands, and we hand them to their families And from any view, the cultural or the grieving view, it is, it makes an enormous difference. And I've done one, you can see the difference that it makes. It's wonderful. So if you need help, we'll do it. Something that uh, comes to mind whenever anyone hears about Angel Flight and they're a pilot is how can I help? And you've mentioned volunteers on the ground and I imagine there's a few pilots who don't meet the criteria at the moment but are able to help by driving. But what are the criteria for um, if someone wants to volunteer as a pilot? Yeah, look, as a pilot, um, we have a slightly higher uh, criteria than than CASA. Uh, but we also have the CASA rules, so that's that's always there and that's, of course, a minimum that we have to comply with. So as a minimum standard, we need 400 hours total time in a GA aircraft. So unfortunately, the four hours uh, in an uh, one of the uh, RAOS type aircraft uh, doesn't work for us and we need 250 in command. Now, uh, CASA only requires 250 unless you're a commercial pilot, in which case they require 150. But we maintain the 250 uh, unless there are exceptional circumstances. So we just have that little bit of a higher standard. And, of course, with our uh, doctor medical flights, we are now um, in front of CASA with all our documents together there for those flights 
to get uh, an AOC or an air transport licence now. And so we will be increasing the standard for those MEDI flights to the uh, airline standard. Okay, so you mentioned that RAO's time didn't count. So that 250 hours command time, that's on a VH aircraft? Correct, yeah. And uh, we we can't use the experimentals and that's actually a CASA rule. Okay. Uh, that the uh, it can't be in the expen- experimental. So basically, it's in uh, VH registered, certified in Australia in the normal or above category. Okay, so two fifty hours normal or above category for um, for being able to do a an angel flight pilot flight. Yeah, but closer it- to airline standards for flying the uh, the doctors, locums, nurses, that kind of thing. Yeah, we at the moment that runs under our normal operation. But if we can get government funding to assist, uh, when you start working with governments, uh, quite often the demands are different. So when we get our uh, government funding, we will use the aircraft for that purpose. And our goal is uh, at this stage to put uh, an aircraft, at this stage it'll be uh, a cabin class twin, uh, something like a, a 402C or a a Navajo chieftain, that sort of thing, in every capital city and in Cairns. And we've started working on that project now, dedicated to the support of people with medical professionals. Obviously, when they're not being used for that, they, they'll be used for patient transfer as our volunteer flights are. So we're well on the way to that project. Okay. So another question for you. Let's shift angles a little bit. I heard you say earlier that you've flown an angel flight, so you're a pilot. Are you able to let us know your your career background in aviation and how you got into this role running angel flight? Yeah, look, um, I'm a barrister by trade and uh, when I uh, I had a busy practice in Townsville, but I, uh, I found myself going to Cairns and Mackay for a lot of my trials and the uh, airline schedules didn't suit. I had three little kids, quite difficult and uh, my husband's in the aviation game as well. So I thought, blow it, um, I better learn to fly. And I did. This was in the 80s and bought a, uh, a Cessna 210 uh, back in early, very early 90s and just started flying myself around. And at that time, in about the year 2000, I was president of uh, AOPA and I was through that role, I got talking to the founder, Bill Bristow, who was looking for pilots. And it occurred to me when he was setting this up that he could probably do with the help of an aviation lawyer. So I started volunteering uh, for the legal work in 2002, it was actually, and still doing it. So <laughs> that's, uh, and then uh, in uh, and doing, doing flying and uh, volunteer legal work. And then in 2014, uh, Bill, our founder, became ill, and uh, there was he, he needed someone to take over. And I had my practice in Townsville at the time, and I said, "Well, I'll I'll come down and sort it out and get it going." But I said, "I'll only stay a year, Bill," <laughs> and that was ten years ago. So I'm still there, <laughs> and still loving to, and love the privilege of being able to do this work. Marjorie, you mentioned earlier that uh, obviously, um, you know, you have to comply with CASA regulations. And of course, in the last few years, you know, this, this sort of volunteerism in, uh, in aviation has come a little bit under the spotlight from regulators. How is your relationship these days uh, with the regulator now? Good, good. We, we're working uh, closely uh, with CASA. We're moving forward to this uh, new stage and uh, we have a good relationship with all the senior executives uh, in CASA and uh, yeah, all good. All good. We're moving forward quickly with this, and uh, and it's good to have them on side and on board. It certainly helps when uh, when they are on board with this type of stuff. And in terms of the aircraft fleet, um, obviously, you know, we mentioned before there's quite a wide range. But somebody's got an aircraft now and they want to bring it into the Angel Flight uh, fleet. Generally speaking, what would you be looking for? Look, we we have everything, and in fact, our largest fleet, if if you can call it that, is. Uh, the Cirruses now because it's very popular uh, with sort of businessmen and professionals and people who are semi-retired to, to buy the Cirrus, so there's a lot of those. Um, Cessna 210s are a big uh, cohort, uh, but we also have a, a big range. We've got the 402s and Titans and 
so on as well, and some of the smaller ones like the barons and duchess, that sort of thing. So we, we go all the way up to we've got quite a few uh, citations, King Airs, um, yeah, the, the jet aircraft, uh, PC-12s, they jump in and help us when we've got uh, a long way to go or a lot of people to carry, and they do it on a volunteer basis as well. Fantastic. I'm being assessed a man myself. Now I've ridden in a few Cirrus aircraft and they're all very nice. Well, they're really nice. But I, I got to, I got to tell you, I am a bit partial to a Cessna 210. I, I yeah. wouldn't mind being uh, shuttled around in one of those. Yeah. And, and uh, we had, well, actually, uh, I had a, a 310 as well. So we used to run our own charter organisation in the background uh, of all this as well. Um, but then we, it all got too busy. So we just kept the 210 and, and sold the 310. But it was a beautiful machine as well. Absolutely lovely to fly, uh, and one of my favourites as well. But once you once you're assessing a person, yeah, a bit hard to get away from it, isn't it? <laughs> there's, there's no going back, is there? There's no. really no going back. <laughs> it's it's like the Mooney Group. You, you can't persuade a Mooney owner that there's anything better. <laughs> yes, well, they love to fly fast. That's what they'll tell you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So, Marjorie, leaving Cessnas aside, I know that hurts for Steve. Sorry, mate. But uh, <laughs> you've mentioned funding and things like that. So if people want to help, how can they help? Well, look, two ways. Uh, firstly, our website's pretty user-friendly and it goes, you can have a look, how can I help? Supporter, driver, pilot, donor, uh, whatever you like. We don't go out and campaign and ask people. But if they want to come to us and say, we can help, uh, the other way that we get a lot of help Quite often people that we help are cash poor, but they have, uh, sometimes they have assets and when they pass away, they're often kind enough to leave us uh, some of their assets or their house. And so bequests are a big part of our funding, uh, but donations, I often hear the smaller clubs uh, like Lions or CWA saying, look, here's a donation, it's not much, but it is so much because you multiply that right across the country, all the clubs, it is. It's what keeps us going. So if people want to help, they can just look on the website and say, well, how best can I do this? What, what am I best suited for? And there's a lot of roles uh, that we can uh, get people. We, we have guest speaking, for example. A lot of our pilots and drivers travel around their region and they might go and speak at an event or a local lines or rotary meeting. And just spread the word, raise awareness, here we are, this is what we do. If you know someone who needs help, tell them. And the word of mouth spreads around. And that would be angelflight.org.au, of course. Correct. I always say to people, if you want to find us, just Google Angel Flight Australia. That's the easy way. (laughs) Certainly is. Marjorie Pagani is the Chief Executive Officer of Angel Flight Australia. It's uh, great to catch up with you, Marjorie, and uh, we certainly hope to do it again in the future. Thanks very much. And again, it's a privilege to be on board with you. You're listening to Playing Crazy Down Under, Australia's aviation show. Stick around, folks. We'll be right back after this. Keeping up to date with the latest news is a huge part of our daily lives. Now you can have news on demand with the Australian Independent Radio News app. News and sport in your pocket whenever you want it. Wherever you are in the world, if you call Australia home, you can stay in touch with the Air News app. Download it now for news on the go. This is Air News. 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 News. Australian Independent Radio News. Welcome aboard the High Fly Media Podcast, dedicated to sharing the stories and experiences of the amazing people who make aviation happen. From pilots like me, to engineers, air traffic controllers and others, I'll explore their personal journeys, the challenges they've faced and the triumphs they've achieved. My name is Damien and I'll be your host. Whether you're a seasoned aviation enthusiast or new to the field, I invite you to join me as we take off on this journey of discovery. Subscribe now on your favourite podcast platform and leave a review to help spread the word. You can find me at highflymedia.com. That's H-I-F-L-Y media.com. Uncovering the people and passion behind aviation, one story at a time. You're listening to Plane Crazy Down Under, Australia's aviation show. It's great to have you with us. Well, back in 2019, which was about a year or so after the conclusion of the original series of PCDU, 
Grant and I were approached by the then owners of Aviation Trader magazine to produce a podcast under their Airwaves brand. Well, that show, which is still available on all podcast platforms, ran through until early 2020, after which point, of course, as we all know, well, let's face it, the world went just a little skew if. One of the interviews we recorded back then was with Steve Paget OAM. Steve's one of Australia's foremost aviation entrepreneurs and, amongst many other achievements, the co-founder of Alliance Airlines. Now, of course, Alliance has been in the news a little of late with all the various legal manoeuvrings surrounding its proposed acquisition by Qantas, but this interview isn't about any of that. Instead, it's a story of positivity. It's an example of self-belief and very much one of success. This is the first of three parts and we'll run the remainder in following shows in the new year. And of course, we thank the current owners of Aviation Trader for allowing us to use this content here. So whether you've heard it before, or whether perhaps this is your first time around, we really hope you find this interview as interesting and as inspiring as we did. Steve Paget, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Steve, um, in welcoming you to the show, I mean, you've been in the uh, the aviation game now since the mid-1960s, and look, here we are looking at 2020 pretty soon, uh, in congratulating you on a, on a long and distinguished career. That must bring back a lot of uh, really uh, happy memories. Yes, it really does. Um, I guess when you've been doing the same thing for all that time, uh, there's continuity involved, and you do remember most of it, and it's pretty progressive, so... Um, I guess a lot of people change jobs and do different things, but I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to be in aviation since I was in high school and 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 fortunately progressed in the right direction from there. You see a lot of people now looking at aviation as a career path uh, who, are, who are in that sort of age bracket in their teens. Do you think it's, you know, how would you compare the prospect of going into the industry now versus, say, in, you know, the mid-1960s? Um, look, I think that's an interesting question in that um, in those days, uh, I mean, I started my, com- I guess, commercial flying the day the first Qantas um, cadet scheme started. Um, I was sweeping the hangar, uh, and in Mark, you know, 10 bright, cheery guys who had got a, a scholarship from Qantas or, or a cadetship, more like it. Um, so that, those were the days Qantas actually gave these uh, cadetships out um, there was a lot of flying training going on in those days. Um, when I was an instructor, eventually um, you'd have 24 aeroplanes in the circuit of Bankstown and well, it was partly in all over the field. So it was pretty much a different environment and still, of course, using, you know, power wheel aeroplanes to learn to fly. Yeah, that's that That was uh, very much the heyday of aviation here in Australia. But uh, what got you into that? I mean, you said you you got your commercial about that time. You were sweeping the hangar. Uh yeah, it was the heyday. How did you get into it? Was it saw an aircraft looked up and were hooked, or or what else? Well, the, the start of it all was really at, at high school when um, when I was fourteen, and I had the opportunity to go to Canterbury Boys High School, John Howard's old school. Um, and that in that, in that time it was a selective school, and not suggesting it was selective. And I was brilliant at academia, which I'm not. Um, but they had a, a cadet uh, flight there, an air training corps flight. And I was fortunate that my tech drawing teacher was the flight commander there, and he was just a wonderful guy. And um, he took me under his wing, and um, and I was uh, I went through the various courses with the air training corps, corporals, uh, sergeant, uh, flight sergeants, and cadet under officer. And I was fortunate to be ducks of the cadet under officer course when I was 16, and uh, that meant I got to go to the Air Force mess. So it was all involved in aviation, particularly the Air Force in the early days. Um, and all I, that's all I thought about it. So my academic results weren't brilliant. Um, I just scraped through the leaving certificate. But what I did have was a passion for flying. And uh, at that stage, um, I had the fortunate also to win a trip to Malaysia as a, as a cadet, um, an exchange visit with other cadets from there. Uh, so I was really sort of becoming a little bit um, uh, experienced, if you like, um, from an aviation perspective. Um, and then eventually the, they had a flying scholarship, um, uh, a 10 flying scholarship issued a year uh, from the Royal Australian Air Force. But it was based on your academic qualifications. And as I mentioned earlier, I wasn't that smart from a point of view. of I spent more time building aeroplanes and in the uh, cadet uh, world um, and uh, not studying as much as I should have. So uh, the 10... T- uh, scholarship awardees were actually based on um, uh, an exam, 
and the exam was based on going into the entry or as entry level uh, as a fighter pilot with a RAF. So I wasn't at the top end of that. In fact, I came out as number 11 and there were only 10 scholarships issued. So unfortunately, I didn't get one. Um, so I was very disappointed. I went off and got a job after school. Um, but what I did know was, um, <clears throat> pardon me, behind the scenes, everyone was working to get me into that uh, tent. Uh, so they managed to quietly move one of the guys out into the permanent air force prior to. And this was planned all along, apparently. I didn't find out until years later uh, so that I could come in as number 10. And uh, I, I started a draft, as being a draftsman, which I hated, for two days, and I got a call from the uh, from the RAF saying you've 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 won uh, the scholarship. Uh, one has one has dropped out. Uh, you're in. Start flying tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> and it's interesting, uh, isn't it? The, so, the the cadet scheme is still around these days, Steve. And uh, you know, in an age where that's perhaps not fashionable, um, I guess you'd be encouraged to see that you know those sort of organisations are, are still around. Oh, absolutely. Well, you, should, you probably know during the Whitlam years. Um, he cancelled uh, all he, – he actually shut down the air training corps. Um, and uh, so all that was lost during those years. Then it came back as almost a civilian organisation and is now back as a real arm of the RAAF, which I'm pleased to be involved in now. Um, so, yes, it is great that that scholarship system and and, and the ability to fly in airport mm-hmm. aeroplanes and all that sort of stuff is all back and running again. So that that scholarship you got, did that uh, just take you to private or offset part of it, or did it take you all the way through to um, to help you get into your commercial? No, the beauty of it, well, when I say beauty of it, it, it was a intense three-week month, or it was almost a month's course at Bankstown Airport. Um, so, And the scholarship only went to private pilot licence. So after that, you sort of decided whether, well, do you want to go in the Air Force or what do you want to do? And they may not have taken you, but... There's an interesting story, and, and I probably should follow this a little later, but there were 10 people in that course, and all of them, of course, were very studious kids with a lot of ability uh, from, a, again, an academic point of view. And um, I do remember that I completed the private licence course and then went on, but of all the 10, I was the only one three years later that actually stayed in aviation. Wow. Uh, so, the, so to me, that's uh, something that says, you know, academic qualifications aren't everything. It's all about passion. It's all about will. It's all about want. It's all about enthusiasm uh, for, for aviation. So um, if I hadn't have gone on, there would have been none of those cadets. It would have been wasted money. And um, one of the things I'm hoping I can do these days is try and make sure that doesn't happen too much again. So you got into aviation, Stephen. You you found your way into the commercial side of things, and uh, I guess eventually into uh, the marketing side of it. Yeah. Well, what happened was that after my I got my um, uh, private pilot license, I managed luckily to get a job at Illawarra Flying School, um, which was managed at that time by Keith and Senior Roby, who are very famous and great people. And uh, chief pilot was a fellow called Eric Greathead, who was another wonderful man. He used to fly the Mustang. Um, on the naval exercises, towing targets, another 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 story in itself. But um, but the only job they could give me was consigning freight. Um, so what I had to do was turn up at six, uh, sorry, five o'clock in the morning, drive to Mascot Airport in an empty truck, pick up all the air freight that came in to be distributed in the western suburbs, drove the truck to Bankstown Airport, while in the meantime. Um, driving around and uh, delivering this, these parcels. Then we had a little air freight office on the side of the hangar, and I'd spend all day consigning the air freight. Then I'd put it in the truck at six o'clock at night and drive it back to to uh, city airport. So, uh, but and, and the and the um, the uh, salary for that was seven pound. Um, and um, uh, but flying lessons in those days were seven pounds. So I always remember Keith Rowe giving me my seven pound. At the end of Friday, and I'd give it straight back to him. On the other hand, for my next flying lesson. So, <laughs> to answer your question, that's how I started my commercial license uh, through Illawarra uh, by earning working all week, earning another flying lesson, and got my commercial there uh, through Illawarra, which was um, which was great. The interesting part of that part of the story is that by doing that, 
um, we eventually flew the freight to Banks to Sydney Airport in a Cessna 172 um, three times a day. So I got greatest experience of my life flying uh, 172s to back to, from Bankstown to Sydney, which in effect was the smallest um, the smallest airline route in the world because it was scheduled. Um, <laughs> and uh, but the back was all full of parcels and mostly chicken, day old day old chicken. But boy, did I get some cross wind landing practice by lay at Sydney Airport. Uh, oh, yeah. times. Um, <laughs> and uh, Keith Bradby was a pretty tough, tough nut. And you had to actually got specially checked into Sydney, and you know it was a real process. But that's how I managed to get some flying time. Um, uh, it was flying back and forwards into Sydney, um, and then I moved on to, to an instructor grade. And you've uh, you've taken that and, and gone off obviously into the uh, the marketing side of stuff. Um, I guess in the sort of the late nineteen uh, seventies, you launched uh, your own business. Yeah. Well, what happened in the middle of all that was um, I got an instructor's rating. Instructing really wasn't for me. I actually started a flying school called Sheerline Flying School at Bankstown. We bought three new, uh, sorry, two new one Cessna one fifties. Were five thousand dollars each, brand new. Good lord! Uh, a new <laughs> a new one seven two was ten thousand dollars, and uh, he had two one one fifties and a one seven two, and I ran that for a while as my own in partnership with somebody else, um, and said this really isn't for me. And then I was just offered a job by Hawker to Havilland, as was in those days, and um, Hawker, I said, well, great. I'm you know I'd really want to get out of instructing, and I'd really wanted to sell aeroplanes. I could see that was a you know, an interesting opportunity. And uh, they said, yeah, but you've got to be, in, you've got kids in Brisbane. And I said, oh, geez, I had a wife and a young wife and a very, very young baby boy. And he, they said, you've got to be in Brisbane by uh, Monday morning. That was Friday when they told me I couldn't have a job. But the condition was that I turned up at Archerfield at nine o'clock Monday morning. So we threw all our possessions, which weren't a lot, in the back of my B.H. Holden drove to Brisbane, um, uh, on, arrived on Sunday, turned up at Archerfield Monday morning for the first day, which is 1970, first day of my life selling aeroplanes, which um, which was uh, turned out to be a really interesting job because in those days, um, aeroplanes were, you ask you about what conditions are like. Um, you could almost say that people lined up at the door to buy aeroplanes in those days. Um, even though you know the, the prices were probably similar to what they are these days, um, uh, there were a lot of uh, bush people buying aeroplanes. In fact, they were the majority. People in the bush bought aeroplanes more than people in the city. Um, so there's a lot of aeroplanes being sold, and I had a wonderful time uh, learning how to sell aeroplanes. An interesting experience was the um, was turning up about a week after I'd started flying. And we had a little, there's a little sort of air show, and a, and we had the Piper and Beechcraft and Cessna displays. And this guy turned up very dishevelled and um, said to me, he said, um, he said, Listen, I've just been talking to those Piper, Piper, Cessna people. And of course, I was Beechcraft with with Hawker to Hubbard. And uh, they, they dismissed me, obviously, because I'm from the bush and I, I guess I've come straight from the farm. Um, what have you got to sell? Well, it was a challenge for me. So, Cut a long story short, at the end of the day, I got a check that I remember distinctly $27,000 for a brand new Bonanza. Wow. Um, wow. Well, and that was uh, that was the start of the dynasty of the people out of Toowoomba who had the big um, charter business. He was the son of the of the, uh, the guy who started uh, Moore's, Moore's Air Transport or Moore's Air Charter. It's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, Cessna and Piper and all those brands are. I guess seen as synonymous with the training side of stuff, and I guess thinking back to those times, you would have, you know, that's still the sort of brand you'd think of. But Beechcraft sort of still carries, to my mind at least, a bit of that prestige. And I, I guess it is back then. If you're saying that a, you know, a one seven two was ten grand and a, a Bonanza was twenty seven, so there's still that scale today, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But as I said, there are more. It was easier, for want of a better word, um, and there are more airplanes being sold. I'm from the smaller airplanes point of view. Um, I stayed in Brisbane for 12 months, um, and then the New South Wales people wanted me to come back there. So it was a bit of a fight between the <laughs> Brisbane manager and the New South Wales manager, but I was keen to get back to New South Wales. Um, and but there, at New South, in, in Sydney at Bankstown, 
there were containers stacked ten high, five high, where they were just uh, there'd be a, probably thirty or forty one seven twos or one fifties in containers at any time um, uh, at Banktown being unloaded. So there was a lot of aeroplanes sold in those days, particularly the smaller training aeroplanes. Because uh, as I said, in those days when you're in the circuit as an instructor, you had to really be careful about it, about these 20 other aeroplanes that were going around and around. <laughs> I think the fun bit is that Steve and I have both logged time in some of those 19, early 1970s aircraft <laughs> when we were doing our training. Yeah, you can guarantee it. Exactly. They're, and they're probably still around, some of those, too. Um, but uh, the interesting time in Queensland was that I managed to spend the time flying um, Jockey Peterson around as Premier um, when when the when the his actual pilot, uh, a, a lady called Beryl Young, who's also quite well known, uh, used yep. to fly him permanently. But um, the Hawkers had a contract to fly the jockey. But I used to, on the on the odd occasion, um, fly him to um, Kingaroy and, and back. Um, so which was very pleasant. And when I left, he wrote me a lovely reference, which was which was nice to have, even though it was from Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back, but back in Bankstown, it was was great because you know that's where all the action was, and and uh, it was just so much fun selling, you know, bonanzas. Um, uh, I hate to say it, Sierras, um, uh, King Airs, uh, Queen Airs, Queen Airs. In those days, I managed to be lucky enough to sell the last Queen Air ever made by by uh, by Beechcraft, and um, uh, that was just great. And I, I was working with people like Brian Blackjack Walker, who was a very famous World War Two. Spitfire pilot, and most of the other other sales were there in those days. Direct Air Force World War Two, you know, um, fighter pilots, um, and because they used them all for their for their record and for their um, uh, history and aviation than anything else. But it was great fun. And yet, uh, so you're having a lot of fun at Hawker to Havilland, and everything was going amazing. But uh, you decided to transition and start your own company. Uh, what what led to that? And and Where'd you get the name Aeromill from? Well, Aeromill came later. Um, what happened was that um, after about 19, um, 1979, I said, no, I've, I've really got to give this a go myself. Um, I had a lot of people who were um, supporting me, wanting me to start my own business um, and um, egging me on, and, you know, including some really interesting and quite famous people in business um, who owned aeroplanes. So I managed to – I, I – I, I, Departed Hawker Pacific or Hawker to Havilland, sorry, there wasn't those days, uh, on very favourable terms. In fact, they actually leased me a little tiny office in the hangar, as, assuming that they'd get some work out of me somewhere down the track. So they actually, actually I left them and they said, we're, we're going to give you an offer because we'd like you to stay around. And uh, so I managed some aeroplanes to get some money in. Um, I couldn't afford a secretary, so I did everything myself. Um, but I had people like... Uh, Oh, uh, consolidated gold fields with customers who had a King Air and Del Geddes who had a King Air and a Queen Air, which I'd sold them all. So it was able to give me a kickstart, really, That, and I thank Hawker to Havilland for that. Uh, it was a great time I spent with them, but they did give me the grounding that allowed me to start my own business, and that was called Australia Air Motive. Uh, and uh, so that was my first private business. And then um, I moved on. Um, and then through again through my relationship with Hawker to Havilland in the old days, met Bib Stillwell, um, I'm sure you've heard of. Who yes, but a well-known racing car driver, but he was also uh, a very well-known piper and beach distributor in Australia. And uh, Bib asked me to set up a dealership in partnership with him for Learjets in New South Wales. So I sort of eventually became the half owner of the Learjet distributorship. Uh, again, a lot of fun, really enjoyed all that. And um, and then um, I st- we started, I got I got very enthusiastic about, enthusiastic about this wonderful aeroplane, I thought it was wonderful anyway, called the Embraer Bandarante. Um, now, the, the yeah. band in those days was only sold in Brazil, um, but to me it looked like a, a perfect aeroplane for Australia. So... Um, in, in all while I was selling aeroplanes and, and fiddling around and trying to make a, a dollar, I had in the back of my mind that I've got to somehow get, get this aeroplane as an exclusive dealership to sell. And um, I said, well, I don't want to do that. I went to Brazil and uh, turned up in 
Sandra Voted Campus, the Embraer factory, where at that time hardly anyone spoke English. They said about I'm for Australia, I'm a marketer, and I'd love to sell your aeroplane in Australia. And what I didn't know was a week before, Jack Maslin had been there. <laughs> and, uh, and Jack, of course, wanted to buy airplanes for his airline, uh, Maslin Airline, out of Kitamundra. And um, they said, well, look, we love what you have to say and what you can do, but we've had the Jack Maslin come and said, he'll buy airplanes, but he wants to distribute ship first. Uh, he wants to distribute ship as part of the deal. And I said, oh, I was so disappointed. Um, and that, but I've, I've, I've still got a very fond uh, relationship with uh, Embraer and they're just wonderful people. And it was a very impressive place to visit, I must say. But anyway, at the end, cut, cut a long story short, they said, look, we really want Steve to sell the aeroplanes. And Jack, to you, we'd love you to operate the aeroplane. So could you two put a company together? Um, and without going into too much detail, unfortunately, I took a minority partnership in, in that company because I didn't have a lot of money. And um, But again, long story short, we managed to sell uh, 20, 27 to 30 band of Andes over the next few years. Um, it, it proved to be a, a wonderful aeroplane. It's still a wonderful aeroplane. There's still many operating around the South Pacific. And, uh, um, and we just did very well. And then I sort of got to know Sir Dennis Buchanan, of course. Um, you know, that time was running Calair. Um, and in New Guinea, and he bought Panda Andes, and then, and then eventually, um, I couldn't work with the Mazding family, unfortunately, and I um, I gave up my share in the in the distributorship in Australia and took on the Southeast Asian distributorship for Embraer, who promised me that one day they would they would end up giving us the Australian distributorship. So again, cut a long story short, um, that's what happened. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in selling Brazilias around Australia and Banderatis. Um, and that's how I got to meet Sir Dennis and became very firm friends with him. Um, and uh, we, that's and that is Aramal, uh, Australia. That's how Aramal started. You know, uh, Aramal being aeroplanes and military, for want of a better word. Because uh, uh, uh. In Southeast Asia. You know, it's interesting you mentioned and the Bandera Andy. The first time I, I think I probably ever saw one, I was uh, just starting my initial up Moorabbin, and there was a, an, an operator there at the time called King Island Airlines, I remember, and uh, every day they yes. flew their bandit yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I kept a bandit on and off, and and it was only probably five or six years ago I sold my last aeroplane. I always wanted to keep one, but um, I ended up happy to – not happy to sell it financially, but it was we weren't operating it. Um, as much as we should have, so I ended up selling it. It's a wonderful aeroplane. So was the Brasilia, which which got, of course, Flight West going. And uh, uh, and uh, that sort of starts the next phase of the story, if you like, uh, in that um, uh, I got to meet Sir Dennis, as I said, a fellow called Scott McMillan, uh, who's become a lifelong friend. And um, we, um, I sold Dennis aeroplanes, blah, 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 uh, Flight West went on to become a very major operator in Australia for ANSTEP uh, and uh, in, in Queensland. And uh, I guess the next phase then was I'm sitting at Mascot Airport with Aeromall Australia, selling Banner Andy, uh, about six or seven people, um, very happy with what I was doing. And um, but I was getting annoyed with you know operating out of out of um, Sydney Airport wasn't easy. Um, not from a I wasn't operating a lot of aeroplanes, but the traffic and all those things, which of course worse now. <laughs> but and I, I, I've always had a gut feeling I wanted to have a start a, a greenfield site, something that was fresh and different. And ever everyone said, no, no, you can't do that. You've got to be in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane. You just cannot go anywhere other than those places and start an aviation business. Anyway, I was determined. Went went home one day to my good wife, and by that time my kids were in their uh, early 20s and said to Lorraine, I said, we're, I, I'm, I, we're moving to Queensland. And she said, well, where are we moving to? And I said, we're moving to the Sunshine Coast. I've always had a hanker. There's a little hanger there that I can buy uh, to do maintenance in. Uh, and there's a lot of potential for building something, building something that I think will be really worthwhile. Um, so we're going to move to the Sunshine Coast. And she says, well, if you want to go, I'm with you. So we went home. Uh, we're on a walk with our dog, 
and uh, went home, told our kids they're going to go out and find somewhere else to live. <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, within a very short period of time, um, we came to Queensland, bought a house and set up a little hangar on Sunshine Coast Airport. Um, and uh, again, or we're, basically what we're doing is selling aeroplanes at that time, uh, including Embraer. We had a big Embraer spare parts business, sort of big one, big one in, in Australian terms. Um, and... Um, here I am saying, what are we going to do next? Um, so what came next was Don Kendall, uh, uh, because I got involved with him and there's um, a name. <laughs> through through the Regional Aviation Association, which interesting in those days was called something else. Um, and uh, we actually started that back in oh, 1980 or thereabouts. Uh, so what is now the RAAA was something we all started together uh, for the first meeting in 1980 with people like Don Kendall and Max Hazelon and, and uh, people like that. So, um, And that uh, was only recently that I, I, uh, I stopped um, being involved uh, only due to business pressures. And so that's where we'll leave that interview there for now in part one of uh, what is actually a three-part series that were recorded there with Steve Paget And Grant, uh, boy, did he drop some big uh, aviation names there in Australian aviation history right at the end. <laughs> yeah, mate. Uh, some some big names involved in the early days of re- regional aviation, thus the RAAA, Regional Aviation Association of Australia, uh, still going to this day and a very important uh, association, lobby group, etc. For and on behalf of the uh, airlines operating out there in Australia's regional areas. And they really do have, well, I don't know how they're operating these days with uh, things that have gone on. There's been quite some changes there at Alliance, but uh, he, he does talk about uh, their theory on operating and how they own aircraft and all that sort of stuff, which I suppose in this modern era is probably quite a bit different. So all that will be coming up in the next uh, couple of uh, chats that uh, we recorded there with Steve Paget. It was a really, really fascinating interview, and I just really thought that running that again now uh, would be quite timely given the news that's going on with that airline. But um, it's if, if you if you never caught up with it when we recorded it originally, it's it's some evergreen content that really – it's just – Really great to listen to. Yep. And uh, a big hats off to the folks from Aviation Trader, the new owners who have given us the okay to rerun that content. Uh, They agreed it was good to get it back out there. Indeed, Grant. Well, uh, I guess that sort of brings this show uh, to an end for this time around. And uh, I do acknowledge uh, it's been a while since we put a show together. So we do appreciate your patience. Of course, um, uh, Grant, we're still doing uh, the Odd Australia Desk segment uh, over there for our great friends at the Airplane Geeks. So if you want to, uh, well, if you're not listening to the Airplane Geeks, well, you should be. But uh, if, if, for, if for some bizarre reason you don't listen to Max and the gang over there and you want to hear our segment where we uh, talk about uh, things uh, really to do with, uh, you know, the aviation news of the week, you can always catch up with us there at australiadesk.net where you can find all those zany segments, Grant. Well, sort of, sometimes, <laughs> in isolation. Well, we have done over 330 Australia Desk segments and I've got about 290 of them loaded. Yeah, some great content there. So we really uh, you know, invite you to get over there and have a listen to that other work that we do. And, uh, well, there's all sorts of other work that we do. You can catch Grant on the Australian Defence Magazine podcast if you're, you're really looking around for some extra holiday listening. <laughs> Actually, there's been some uh, pretty good episodes uh, on the state of defence and industry here in Australia. It's a, it is a, a defence industry-focused uh, magazine and podcast, but we've had some good content and you can see people going, oh, I'll listen to that one, oh, I'll listen to that one, and some people go, oh, I'll listen to all of them. We call them dedicated. Yes, we do indeed. Well, you know, there's this, and that's the cool thing about podcasting. You know, you can listen into, uh, you know, to any niche that you like. And you know, Grant and I produce a lot of content for a, a lot of uh, separate niches for some of our uh, production clients. So, uh, yeah, I guess too, uh, while we're doing some shameless self promotion, Grant, uh, if you're, you're looking to start a podcast of your own and you're not too sure how to do it, well, uh, drop us a line. Uh, we'll, we're happy to help you out. Yep. No, definitely happy to help people out as we've done. People have helped us out and we've helped others out as well. So, uh, yeah, always happy to uh, give a hand. And if it gets commercial and you're actually doing it for money and all that, hey, we can help take some of that money for you. Oh, yeah, we're happy to take your money. That's absolutely oh, yeah. 
Yes. And, of course, that uh, email address is uh, contact at plaincrazydownunder.com. And uh, as always, you know, we'd just love to hear from you for feedback on the show. Um, we'd really like some feedback from listeners actually on this uh, 2023 series where we brought the show back out of a little bit of a slumber of about uh, five or six years. And, uh, <laughs> so we'd uh, love to know your thoughts on that. So contact at plaincrazydownunder.com. And, uh, you know, Mick at the Frankston line knows how to do that, so, you know, everybody else should have a crack too. <laughs> yep, can always count on Mick to drop us a line and say hi. He's awesome like that. But, uh, mate, I just want to point out that we've just completed Lucky 13. Well, of course, as you know, Grant, I'm never too superstitious about such things. After all, my birthday is on the 13th of a month. Yes, well, so that does go. explain a lot, doesn't it? Well, and, and uh, I'm, left, I'm left-handed as well for, for whatever that means, so... Mate, how did we ever manage to get anything done? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we do a lot of things completely backwards, so that probably explains it, really. Well, we are down under. That's right. It's what's down under the counts. Hey, that's your line anyway. Correct. There's an old line. You're you're using it at last. Huzzah. (laughs) Okay, enough rambling on for now. Thanks very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Steve Isher, on behalf of Grant McHeron, wishing you all very safe flying, folks, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Find show notes for this episode along with our contact details and a full back catalogue of shows at plaincrazydownunder.com. Drop us a line anytime with feedback, story suggestions or advertising inquiries. We'd love to hear from you. Title music is You Name It by Brian Simpson. Plain Crazy Down Under is a Southern Skies media production. Southern Skies Media.